activities and diseases, as well as outbreak of lupus and diseases, extreme event damage, negative effect on soil due to extreme rainfall and temperature are most important factor which can be associated of climate change on subtropical fruits. Phenological shift in response to climate change have been reported from different parts of the globe, such as Europe, United States, Australia, and East Asia. Impact of climate change are likely to be adverse. So needed a careful adaptation strategy and preparedness for harnessing good opportunities. Adaptation is important, but mitigation must be part of adaptation. The, of, the aim of holding this event is to increase the knowledge of the Bonacore University Agroecotechnology student and lecturer regarding the topic of fruit production and its impact caused by climate change. Last but not least, my deepest gratitude goes to the all committee who have directly and indirectly supported the success of this event. Although we try our finest to be professional on behalf of Universitas Diponegoro, please accept our sincere apologies should there be inconveniences that occurred before, during, or after the event. With this word, I declare the invited lecture program open. May God bless us all with good heart to make this event a successful and enjoyable one. I do hope you will enjoy this lecture. And finally, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. For a welcoming speech. Ladies and gentlemen, now we will begin the main session. Please allow me to share a little bit background of our moderator. Uh, thank you very thank much for... Oh. Can you please share the CV? Okay, our moderator today is Mr. Albertus Fajar Irawan, SPM AGR PhD. He is a lecturer from Agroeco Technology Study Program, Faculty of Animal and Agricultural Sciences. He finished his bachelor degree at Institut Pertanian Bogor or Bogor Agriculture University and master degree at Kochi University Japan and doctoral degree at Ehime University and so many publications and proceedings he has published. To Mr. Albertus Fajar Irawan, place is yours. Thank you very much for moderator uh, for the MC. So uh, I would like to thanks to the dean of the faculty of the Animal and Agriculture Science, Professor Rupamba, for the welcome speech, and I would like to say good morning to our special. Uh, a lecturer from University of California. Good morning, Dr. Ashraf. Can you hear our voice? Yes, I can hear you. Good morning. Can you hear me? Uh, Dr. Ashraf? Yeah, can you hear me? Hello? 
Suaranya Mas Fajar kurang keras. Suaranya Mas Fajar kurang keras tuh. Ya, yeah, I can hear you, but can you hear me? Oh, ya, yeah, ya, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. So, Dr. Asraf is a lecturer and also um, assistant of corporate, corporate extension specialist from the Department of Botany and Plant Sciences, University of California, Riverside. So, it's very great pleasure to meet you. And today we have a special uh, event on visiting lecturer and all the lecturers and the students from the Agro-Ecotechnology Agri Study Program, the Department of the Agriculture, Faculty of Animal and Agriculture Scientists, Diponegoro University, would like to express our sincere gratitude and appreciate your valuable time to give us a special lecture today with very interesting topic, the impact of the climate change on subtropical food production system and its mitigation strategy. But uh, before we start uh, the class, Dr. Asra, I would like to read the profile of you. So, excuse me. Pakai itu. Uh, Dr. Asraf L. Keremai is now Assistant Cooperative Extension Specialist, Horticulturist, and also a lecturer in the Department of Botany and Crop Sciences. Uh, he obtained Bachelor of Science in 1991 in Horticulture and Master of Science in 1996 in Pomology from Ain Sams. University Cairo, Egypt. And then he obtained PhD uh, doctoral degree e ENP in Satolos University, France in Grapevine Physiology in 2003. And he also received Leopold Escande Award for excellent PhD research work in INP Tolos, France in 2004. Now, uh, during his work, he has published over 50 scientific publications uh, in rep reputable journals from 2015 to 2023. So the topic is now that he will present is strongly related with uh, all the people in the world are facing now, especially the effect of the uh, the effect of climate change on tropical fruit productions, the horticultural fruits such as citrus, berries, grape uh, grow well in the tropical and subtropical climates. But increase of the temperature is likely to have more prominent effect on the reproductive biology and of those crops. The rapid development of fruit and maturity had been predicted in uh, fruits such as citrus, grapes, and berries. Yeah due to increase of the temperature. The faster maturity and quick ripening may reduce the fruit availability period. Besides, the populations of the pollinator may be the size, the change of the color, and the taste of the fruits also impacted by high temperature. Dr. Asraf will further uh, explain in detail about the change of the, I mean, the impact of the climate change on this uh, fruit production in this uh, session. So, Dr. Asraf, we are about to start the class. Yeah. The, presenters, the presentation time is about 60 minutes, but we can give extra time if your presentation is over 60 minutes. It's okay, no problem. And after the presentations, we will continue with the questions and discussion with the students. So, now would you please start the presentations. The time is yours. <laughs> Dr. Asraf, yeah. please, uh, you yeah. can start the presentation. Yeah. Um, um, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, first, I would like to thank you so much for the nice uh, presentation, nice uh, introduction. Uh, and I would like to thank Dr. 
Professor Dr. Wahib for uh, his introduction and welcoming me in this uh, session. And uh, I'm glad that um, uh, your faculty members and the, your school is ranking high in Indonesia and in Asia. Um, so congratulations. And uh, um, I was so happy when I received this invitation because I wish everybody in the world do the same thing, looking for um, knowledge and try to approach everybody. So um, congratulations again for this program as well. It's a nice program. And I think that will be uh, very beneficial for your students and for your faculty. And uh, just um, improving the networking and connecting with other people, not especially me, but other people in the world. That's how uh, you gain knowledge. How, that's how you improve the system. So please, if you don't hear me at any time, just let me know, okay? Can you hear me? Okay. You hear me, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. We can hear you, Doctor. Yeah, okay. Okay. Doctor okay. Garibi. Okay. Thank you. So, um, so my 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 name is Ashraf Al Kremi. I'm lucky to be seen from my CV. I'm originally from Egypt, and um, and I got my master degree and uh, bachelor of science from Egypt. And at that time, also, I participated oh. in establishing um table grip industry in citrus industry in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And then I got my PhD from France and I went from France to Canada to USA. And right now I'm the director of Linkoff Research and Extension Center. It's one of the major citrus um, research centers in California and in USA as well. So just before I start, um, for those who are interested in citrus or doing research in citrus, uh, you are welcome to contact me and also we have a large number of varieties here and um, we'll be happy to answer any question any information you need about any varieties um there is my email and uh, you are welcome at any time to contact me um and i'll be happy to help if i can so the topic we are talking about it today it's a hot topic and the uh, Lots of people over the world, they are interested in this and try to find the strategies to um, deal with the climate change. And the problem, as Dr. Uh, Wahib said, you know, it, it can be bad, it can be good, and it's changing from year to year. So it's really um, some kind of, there's some kind of frustration because you don't know which direction you will go. You go for drought or you go for flooding. So that is what we are experiencing right now. Can you, um, next slide, please? Next slide, yeah. So that, that is basically what you expect during the climate change. We expect lots of things. Like you said, you know, it's drought and flood, and storms, heat waves, uh, cold weather, warm weather, uh, precipitation, um, everything, um, high level of uh, sea level, and the um, dry land. Sometimes you get more insects, more disease. You can expect everything. That is probably what you are expecting. Um, it's something different from what we are living right now. Next slide, please. So lots of models have been studying the, the climate change, what they are expecting. But one model, they were expecting what happened if the temperature increase one Celsius over the world. And that is most of the people now, they are going toward this, like global warming, the temperature will increase because of um, the activities of the humans in the in the in the world in the earth and producing um a lot of um 
greenhouse gas emissions, so the temperature will increase. And when it will increase, you will have all these things. Like you have short wet winters, you can have some dry land and they expect lower yield in some crop, um, poor fruit quality in some areas. But at the opposite side, also there's some area in the world that will be beneficial from these exchanges. And, um, you know, I know some area in the world where the people start farming, where they never farm in these areas because, say, for example, the low temperature. But with the global warming and increasing temperature, they start producing more and more. So it can be bad for some area. It can be uh, good in, in some area. Most of the area where they are producing agriculture crop right now, you will have some impacts and this impact can vary from area to area crop to the crop variety to variety so it's not consistent uh, next please so again with the heat you lose a lot of water from the the soil and also there is a shortage of water because the rainfall will uh, drop um, in some area so that is the drought the world drought map area and you can see some area like california here we are suffering from the drought although this year we had a flood in the beginning of the season and also that is the opposite because it came in in a time that we don't need it so the water came in a timing that we don't need it so it caused some damage in some crops next please So how this will affect the agriculture? As I said, some area will be benefits from this and some area like the green, dark green ones, like um, Egypt, for example, here, um, Canada will be benefits from this because those are, um, maybe the temperature is not that high in this area and you will get more rain, you get more uh, less, like high temperature, but not very high. The other area, like California, the southern area of California, you will see more um, a, a negative effect of the, the climate change. But that is one of the model. Uh, next, please. So how this is gonna affect our production cycle? As you see here, production of subtropical fruits it goes through um, the cycle of the plants. So in the winter, you have the dormant trees or slow growing trees. They are not dying, but still they have no leaves or they have some leaves, but the root system is, is somehow slow. It's not uh, active during the low temperature. And then when the temperature goes up in the spring, they start flowering and they start growing. Like the all metabolism start to be activated in, in the spring. And during the summer, you can see producing leaves and fruits. And by the end of the summer, you have the fruits and the cycle goes on and on. What moves this cycle around? It is the temperature or the weather condition. So during the winter, you need the low temperature, especially in the deciduous fruits, like you have the, the fruits that drop the leaves in the winter, we call it deciduous fruits. They have to receive special amount of low temperature to be able to grow again in a good condition in the spring. If the winter is not cold enough, so the buds will not grow in the spring. And then in the spring, for pollination and form the, the, the fruits, you have, you, you need to have a moderate temperature, not so high, not too low. Because also some of the pollination or fruit set would be depends on the uh, insect. And the insect activities, it's related to the uh, temperature. Like say, for example, this year in California, 
we had a low crop in the navel orange because the cool weather during the bloom, during the flowering. During flowering, we have a cold weather and the bees didn't go out for pollination. So you have less fruits on the tree. That is because only drop the temperature during the bloom. And then during the, the summer, to have a mature fruits with a high quality, you need what we call it growing degree day. The growing degree day, that is the temperature above five Celsius that will be received by the fruits and that's allowed the fruits to grow and then start the maturation and the ripening process. If you don't have this temperature, the fruits will not ripe and it can stay on the, on the tree until they got rotten. So you need temperature, specific temperature at each um, period of those. So today we're gonna give you some examples of what we have done in the research and what what um, my thought about how we can uh, mitigate the effect of this climate change in uh, subtropical fruits. Next, please. As I said here, the chilling temperature during the winter. Not all varieties have the same requirement. Some varieties of the same crop, they need high chilling units. It means that they need a very cold temperature during the winter to be able to grow again in the spring. Some they don't. Some crop like pistachios, for example, they need high temperature, a high uh, number of chill units. Table grapes doesn't need that much, but still within pistachio and within table grapes, there is some variation among varieties. So you need to, if you are expecting to see some problem with the winter, having a, a warm winter, so you need to go for the low chill unit or low chill varieties that doesn't require too much um, uh, cold temperature during the winter so they can grow better. Next, please. So naturally, you are supposed to, that's supposed to happen naturally, like receiving the normal uh, number of shell unit during the winter. If you plant the trees or the variety in a right condition, in a right location, you will be able to make it without any interruption, without any external factors. But sometimes, like the climate change, if you have a tree, you cannot remove it and the area become warmer. So you need to do add some additional treatments to improve the bud break and improve those chill unit. There's so many uh, methods in the literature about how we can uh, like supplement the chill unit in case of the warmer winter. Uh, next, please. So that's what happened. That's what were the people are expecting to see uh, during the coming years. The shell unit in the winter will start to decline and it started already from 2000 and going down. So you are expecting to see a lower number of shell unit in the winter. What that means, the winter will be warmer. It means that you have to look for those varieties that doesn't require too much uh, cold in the winter. And there is so many breeding programs over the world right now to try to produce more varieties that has low chill unit. That's what we call low chill unit varieties. Uh, and pistachios and table grapes, um, other crops as well, deciduous fruits. So that is how you're going to deal with the climate change. You have to adapt yourself. Just select varieties or make a breeding program that can help you um, in, in, in this issue. Next, please. Again, that is California here. And that is a model for the shell unit because 
in California, we grow almond, we grow pistachios, we, we grow walnuts. And it, as I said, some something like pistachios, they need a lot of shell unit during the winter. Uh, almond, some varieties, they need high shell unit, some they, they need low shell unit. So the breeding program right now is focused on, on this shell unit, how I can um, satisfy the, the units for this variety. But we are expecting lower and lower every year of shell unit during the winter, like you can see here from 1950 up to uh, 2099, you will expect a lower every year, lower shell unit in the California. And that means that you need to produce fruits from a variety that has low shell unit. They don't need too much cold in the winter. And for sure, that's going to take years. Producing any variety from any uh, crop is going to take probably around 15 years. So you, you have to start right now. You cannot start when the winter is warm. No. You have the models. You are expecting this. So you need to start uh, right now. Because 15 years from now, we have the, the variety. Next, please. So that's what I was saying. Um, when you don't have this uh, shell unit in the winter, you will have low bud break in the spring. Low bud break means that every bud break, if every bud grow in the spring will give shoots and the shoots have flower and the flower will form the fruits. Fruits form the crop. So if you don't have one bud or one bud of those doesn't grow, it means that you are losing money. That is one thing. It can happen, but you can say, for example, you have 10 buds on the branch, see a regular or delayed uh, bud break, you see like out of 10 buds, you will get five of them growing and the other five, they don't grow. That's because of the shell unit. The, they didn't have enough cold during the winter to grow again in the in spring. Okay, that is that's another issue. And that will affect the yield in total, the quality also, because when you don't have enough shell unit, the bud break, we we'll call it erratic uh, bud break. It means that, you know, one bud will grow now and three, four days from now, we have other buds are coming. In 10 days from now, we get another bunch of buds are coming. So at harvest time, that will make a difference. So the quality of the fruits will not be the same. And we are in a world that you are targeting premium quality, like very high quality. So that will make it very difficult for marketing. So that is, you see how it started in the winter and is going up to the market. So that's what we, we need to keep it in mind. That's why most of the growers, they are looking for this <clears throat> uh, treatments to have like complete the shell unit or have variety that has low shell unit. So you don't need, we don't suffer from all of this. So next, please. That's one experiment I have done a long time ago in table grapes. And you can see at your right, um, the row of the table grapes that we didn't spray it with anything during the winter. And you can see the vegetative growth, the leaves, the green stuff is not uniform. While in the left, we spray the vines with uh, Dormix. It's a commercial product. And the, it's hydrogen cinnamide. You know, it's a very dangerous product. It has some specific steps to use and has um, a good effect on uh, the bud break in table grapes. And it's a common practice in so many um, um, area in the world. And if you spray it on the right timing, on the right variety, with the right concentration, you will get very high but break, like you can see here, you go from 44 to 94% of bud break. As I said, those bud break 
it means that they are growing shoots and the shoots will have clusters and have roots. It means that uh, you have a crop. If you don't spray that, you can believe it, it's almost half, less than half of the crop. You get it if you don't spray it. And you spray it one time in the winter, but again, has to be done in the right way. Not all varieties, they will receive the same amount. The timing is different from variety to variety and the concentration also. So you need to work on this and optimize. It's a one example of using one chemical one time to overcome uh, the erratic bud break or the bud break and uneven bud break in table grapes. Next, please. Um, after growing in the in the spring, as I said, um, that's related more to table grapes. Uh, they have what we call a double sigmoid curve for growing. So after pollination, you start a rapid increase in the cell size and cell number. That's a logarithmic increase in the cell size. And then somehow the fruits reach the maximum of its size and they stop here. I said, okay, I'm going to change now to maturation. Maturation, it means that shifting all the complex uh, compound, organic compound in the, in the fruits into simple compounds, like carbohydrates will go to sugar, protein will go to amino acids, and so on. And that's what we call it the variation or the color break stage. Okay, at this color break stage, a lot, of, a lot of changes happen here. So there's so many things that determine the quality of the grapes at harvest. This curve needs some specific temperature at each stage. If you mess up or if you change the temperature, that definitely will affect the, the this curve. Um, next, next, please. So that is what what we call it the um, growing degree days. So you need specific temperature above five Celsius for how many days to grow this variety. That is why we grow one variety here and one variety in another location because they say, for example, the summer is longer in this area. So I can grow the varieties that has um, a longer degree days or higher degree days. In another area, the summer is short, so I have to select those variety that has low degree days. Say, for example, in table grapes, flame seedless, it's a short variety. Need low degree days to form the nice and the crunchy and the colored grapes. Others uh, varieties they might need a longer summer. So that is something also we need to look at it. When you have a specific area and you need to grow this variety, you need to look at this growing degree days. It is the number of days above uh, five Celsius that will allow the fruits or the, the curve I show it to be normal. Having a fast increase in size in the beginning and then a variation and then ripening stage. Next, please. So look at the temperature, like I said, this, gra this graph or this curve, the double sigmoid curve that it's in grapes, they need, or any other fruits, uh, they need a specific temperature. And from the literature, people found that this temperature that's optimum for growing any plants in the world will follow this uh, normal curve. So with the increase in the temperature, you increase the growth rate of any plants up to 35 Celsius. When the temperature reaches this inside the plants, the plants start to stop all the metabolism and all enzyme will be declining and going down. So somehow the plants, they go shut down completely at 35 Celsius degrees. So some crop like grapes, 
yes, they like the warmer weather, but when it reach 35 Celsius inside the, the tissues, they cannot make it anymore. It's done. And that's because the enzymes stopped. Photosynthesis also decline, respiration decline, everything decline inside the cell, which would be translated to stopping the growth in the plants, in the fruits. The fruits will be small, definitely. And color-wise, they will not color. That is how the temperature is affecting the whole crop. If you look at the cell, and apply this on the cell and then take this, this to the fruits, you will understand exactly how we can treat this plant. So if you keep this graph in mind, while you are doing all your management and farming, you'll be able to produce um, a good uh, a good fruit and a good crop. There's so many methods um, for management, for reducing uh, the effect of high temperature. Uh, I will show you some today, but in case if you need more information, contact me. I will be happy to help. And also, in the literature, there are so many uh, literature over the world now talking about temperature and how we can reduce the negative effect of the temperature. Okay. Next, please. Like citrus here. <laughs> citrus is a little bit different because citrus is evergreen trees. Okay. And uh, they don't like the very low temperature. That is the other sign. Okay, so it has also a specific temperature to grow. And also, look at those the the column here. We have different variety of citrus like navel orange, clementine, tangerine. Everyone has its own temperature to tolerate. Like when the temperature goes very low during the season, it can kill the tree sometimes in some varieties or just reduce the the growth rate so you don't need for subtropical you don't need a very high temperature or very low temperature you need some you, are, you need something in in the middle so you can make the trees grow and produce high quality fruits next please Like again, that is the temperature, critical temperature. And if you are interested in citrus and growing uh, orange and mandarin, so you need like like minimum temperature. You cannot go below uh, this temperature and expect a very high um, crop or high quality crop. You may grow the tree without dying, but you will not have fruits or if you have one or two fruits per tree, that's it. But that's not what we are looking for. We're looking for um, a very high crop with high uh, premium quality. Next, please. So as I said, there's so many practice in the farm and in the vineyard and orchard you need to follow to protect your um, trees and the crop from the climb. Like see here to the left, you can see the whole canopy of table grapes is covering the clusters. And in this case, there is no direct exposure of the cluster to the sun. So you don't have this uh, bad effect of the sun. Like here to the right, you can see the damage happened to the, the cluster. When the cluster are very exposed to the sun, the temperature of those clusters sometimes goes up to 40, which is... As I said, if you remember the graph, the normal graph for the temperature, it shouldn't go beyond 35 Celsius. Next, please. Again, that is example of when you protect your fruits or just leave it without protection to the right. In, in table grapes, uh, here in California, we like the green grapes to be green not amber or not yellow like this. Maybe can can be beneficial in some varieties like the raisin varieties. If you are doing raisins, it can be beneficial sometimes, but also will delay the maturation if the temperature is high in the beginning. Next, please. 
Again, that's how when you protect the fruits, you get a better color like this. If you are producing for export, the green varieties should be green like the one to the left, not the one to the right. That's the one to the right. Uh, we cannot market this in California. We call it amber fruits, and that is it's not marketable. It has to be a green like this. And to be able to produce a green variety like this, you need to protect the vines, to protect the clusters, either um, having a, a big canopy or um, in some countries like um, South Africa, they put knitting on the top of the vineyards. So to reduce the very high temperature or the, the sun radiation, so you can produce a good quality grapes. Next, please. So again, the same one. Again, here, that is the size also. As I said, you know, if the temperature is very high in the beginning, you would use the size. So you have to be very careful during the whole double sigmoid curve I showed you in the beginning. If the temperature happened in the beginning, you will have a reduced size. If it happened by the end, you'll have a light color like uh, the amber one or like this one. So temperature effect can be different from the beginning to the end of the harvest. Next, please. Again, for um, some varieties, if it's too much temperature or very high temperature during grinding process, the berries started to lose water. And when you start to lose water, you have soft berries. That's what we call it soft berries. Soft berries cannot be marketable also. You cannot send it to the market if you have a soft berries. Right now, for table grapes, you need a large, uh, berry, crunchy, and firm. Soft berries, it's not what we are looking for, but it does happen sometimes when you have heat stress, especially heat stress plus drought. Next, please. Um, excessive berry shattering, like you can see here, if it does happen, if the temperature happened in the beginning, so the berry, um, they got toasted by sun or the heat, and they drop. So you end by cluster with low number of berries, which is not also good, or it's not a premium quality grapes. Next, please. Um, again, that is the 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 damage. If you, even if you are producing amber fruits like this, some countries in Europe they like the amber fruits. They don't like the green to be green. They like the green varieties to be yellow a little bit. And even in this case, if you have too much sun, like the one in in the left, you get some raisins, some drying fruits inside the clusters, and that's also um, a lost uh, crop. Next, please. So that's all about fruits. How about the vine itself? The vine itself, it can face this, the drying of the shoots and dying completely, collapsing. Why? Because the whole like when you reach temperature beyond the 35 Celsius, the photosynthesis is stopped. And if the condition in the ground, it's not really good, like shortage of water or any other disease, this temperature will make it very complicated for the vine to survive. And what happened, the vine will collapse. So that's another thing we need to look at it. Like in this case, you have salinity in the soil and the heat. That is two factors that, you know, the vines cannot tolerate it anymore. And what happened, they shut down completely and decide to die. That can happen with the drought and the heat, um, salinity and the heat. Uh, any uh, biotic stress also with the heat can, the heat can make it um, happen faster. Like the dying of the uh, of the vine will be faster if you have a heat condition. Next, please. Okay. Um. Now we're gonna shift to 
the fruit maturation, the curve that I was talking about it and how this, uh, if you touch this curve will affect the fruit quality negatively and you affect the crop. That is a piece of work that I have done a long time ago. And we were trying to understand what's going on, what happened when the berry start to ripen or it start to go in a fruit maturation. And we found that, you know, when you add uh, ethylene or acephone, the ethylene is a, a ripening hormone. And when you add it from outside, exogenous application, you can improve the color of grapes. And you improve the color because you improve the gene expression of phenyl propanoid pathway. Next, please. Next, please. Okay, that's how, that's what I said, you know, when you add the acephone or acelin, you will turn the grapes from red, I mean, the red varieties, when they are at the variation stage, when you spray acelin or acephone, you can improve the color, accelerate the ripening. Next. And that is what that uh, what happened. That is the phenyl propanoid pathways, and the acetylene will go in this phenyl propanoid pathway and increase the gene expression, which will produce the anthocyanin or the red color in grapes. So when you have acetylene, you have ethylene, you increase the gene expression, and then you increase the anthocyanin uh, content in the grapes. Next, please. So again, this pathway is controlled by temperature. Like you can see here, when temperature is 25 Celsius, the production of anthocyanin content is high. When you reach 35 Celsius, almost half of the anthocyanin will be formed or maintained in the in the in the berries. Is it because the temperature destroying the anthocyanin or stopping the gene expression, that's we're gonna know in a few minutes. But the bottom line, higher temperature, low color in the grapes. And also it's not only this, but the red color in grapes, you need cooler nights, which we don't see it in so many areas in the world right now. You need a cooler night for anthocyanin to be formed and give us uh, uh, red berries, which is not happening because of the climate change. Okay, next. Mm -hmm. That is one example here in some area in, in, in California, when you have the normal temperature and the higher the maximum temperature goes beyond 35 Celsius. Uh, 35 Celsius, that's here, the scale is in Fahrenheit, around 95, but it's beyond 100 during during the day. And that is definitely will have a negative impact on the grapes here. This area, it's a major area for table grape production in California. And some of the varieties in this area, they cannot make it anymore. They cannot produce it anymore because they cannot tolerate this high temperature. Take crimson, for example. Crimson is one variety that's red variety, but we cannot grow it anymore in this area because uh, the temperature is not suitable for this um, uh, variety anymore. So we need to go for another variety. Uh, next, please. Mm. That is how when you grow the, um, the grapes in a, in a bad area or not really low cool temperature at night you can see the grapes are not colored very very well next please so in this case we have to find a solution okay if you have already vines like with age 2025 you need to find a solution you need to try different um, um uh, like treatments to be able to produce this. And in the beginning of stable grapes, we use acephone only to increase the grape coloration. 
but also people start looking for more options to improve the color because of the heat. So we start adding abscisic acid or the, or the proton here and mix it together and you get better results. I'm not saying that this treatment will work for all the varieties, but in this case, this variety uh, was helpful to start to see untreated to ethophone. And then when you add the ethophone plus the abscisic acid, it will also increase the color further. So we need to be more innovative and more open mind to try. But when you try, don't try at large scale. You try at small scale. Next, please. Um, that is, um, we were comparing two areas in California, growing one variety in two different areas. One area, San Joaquin Valley to your left, which is high, uh, has a moderate temperature. Coachella Valley has very high temperature. And we're looking at improving the color in this area. So usually in the high temperature, you have less coloration. So one of the the treatment we, we use is to reduce the water at variation when the uh, berries start to arrive. We reduce the water for a while and then that will induce abscisic acid and abscisic acid increase the color. But with the temperature, sometimes you cannot get this. So like you can see here, we collect the samples from the, the vines and the the dark red, it is the, the, the stage four or the category number four. So you have in San Joaquin Valley, you were able to increase this by deficit irrigation. When you impose low deficit or mid moderate or high deficit irrigation, you can increase the red color. But in Coachella Valley, you cannot. You can increase category number three, but not category number four, because the high temperature. High temperature, it's a main factor it can determine exactly what is your quality, what's your crop. Next. So we extracted the anthocyanin or the red color pigment um, from the two different locations. And you can see uh, the anthocyanin content is overall, it's low in Coachella Valley, which has higher temperature than the San Joaquin Valley. Next, please. We're trying to understand, we'll look at the gene expression of the U of G gene, which is the last gene in the anthocyanin biosynthesis. And again, when you do the treatment in uh, San Joaquin Valley, which has a moderate temperature, you can increase the color. However, in Coachella, you can increase it, but it's way less than the, the San Joaquin Valley. So. It looks like the temperature, it's a main factor to turn on and off all these genes. Next, please. Again, we're, we're trying to understand what's happening. And if you look at the bad effect of the temperature also from the literature, they were talking about the antioxidant activities. So what happened when you expose the, the, the grapes to high temperature, you will produce what we call it ROS or reactive oxygen species or hydrogen peroxide. And this hydrogen peroxide or, or ROS would be sometimes bad for the cells. It can destroy the anthocyanin, so it can degrade it. It can stop other genes. It can um, uh, affect the cell growth itself. And that is the case here. We looked at the enzyme activities that um, transform this ROS to water. So it's kind of a detoxification. And the, this enzyme, the PPO poly, uh, uh, polyvinyl oxy, um, oxidase is, is like one of those enzymes. And you can see in the Coachella Valley, you have less activities of this enzyme compared to, um, to the San Joaquin Valley. The same thing for the BOD activities, also the peroxidase activities, so another gene, and you have the same thing. So it means it, it looks like high temperature will affect those enzymes, 
like we said in the beginning, when it reaches 35 Celsius, will shut down the enzymes. Those enzymes are very important to remove the ROS or hydrogen peroxide. If they are not there, it means the ROS, which is toxic for the plants and the cell, will be there, and that will degrade the anthocyanin and will affect the gene expression of the anthocyanin pathway. And by the end of the day, you have low quality fruits. Next, please. So, as I said, there's so many um, treatments that we can do. There is so many strategies that we can do to mitigate and face the climate change. But that's just, you know, this lecture, it's kind of short presentation about the importance and how we can um, study this. But in reality, we will need a larger program to deal with this. Starting with the breeding, as I said, select for the tolerant varieties. If you don't have breeding program, you need to establish a breeding program and target those low chill unit varieties. Um, stress or heat tolerant varieties. Heat tolerant varieties, there is so many things that you can use it to screen those varieties. Uh, irrigation optimization, because so many uh, literature talking about if it's hot, if it's during the heat waves, you need to irrigate. And that's what we tell the growers here in California. When you expect heat waves, you need to irrigate. But what happens if you don't have water? You need to find other solution. <laughs> uh, we have some other, other research on this, like what you see here in the picture. We're putting like kind of white plastic on the top of the soil so we keep the soil moisture. So during the heat waves, the negative effect will be less, and you can um, you can reduce the water use as well. Uh, we need to understand the abiotic stress tolerance physiology and management, <clears throat> like what we are doing today. You just need to understand if you understand how the temperature works or how it it's doing its negative effect on the cell. So you can design treatment to help the plants. Uh, we need to be more innovative, like um, find something out of the box. Like the one we are doing here, reflective ground mulching, is not only affecting the water in the soil, but it's also reflecting light, and this light can activate some of the antioxidant activities. Uh, the biostimulant is a new field in agriculture and it can be also beneficial. Nutrition. Uh, so nutrition also is very important. You need, you need to optimize the nutrition like the picture I showed. When you have a weak vine or a weak, a weak tree and expose them to heat, they will die completely. But if you have a, a strong tree, can tolerate uh, the heat. Antioxidant, it's a very um, um, major branch right now in so many publications uh, talking about this antioxidant and how we can use it to improve all overall tree health. Heat protectant, some product in the market right now just to make a coating like when you spray it, make a coat, so the the um, the trees or the leaves they will not um, like um, feel the the heat or reduce the temperature of the leaves. So it can help also the trees. Knitting, as I said, for table graves in some countries, they put knitting on the top of the graves so can have some shade and also um, help in the in the climate change. Next, please. I think that's all uh, what I have today. It's just, you know, the time is not enough to talk and talk about climate change and what you can do. It's more um, someone like me in my lab or uh, what we are doing is just see what is the issue on the ground and try to design a research project to deal with this issue and try to solve it for the grower. And maybe some of you don't they don't know what is extension mean. 
um, extension people here in USA or in California, they work with the growers. So instead of designing the, the work in the lab and take it from the lab to the field, we are doing the opposite. We are talking to the growers and see what is the issue and then design treatments and try to understand the issue and help the growers. So we are working at the opposite way. We are dealing with the growers and try to understand the issue using our expertise in physiology and molecular biology and then design treatment for them and then take this treatment to them say, okay, you're gonna do this and it's gonna help. That's how the extension is working and University of California, it's uh, well known for its um, extension program. I have nine research centers like the one I have here and those research centers uh, they have so many people working on extension and uh, we are helping the growers. And that is what is the difference between us as a um, professor of extension and professor for academic at the campus. At the campus, we teach for students and they do academic research and then take it to the growers. We do the opposite. We teach the growers and then solve the issue. Okay. Any... Um, if you have any questions, that's my email, and uh, feel free to um, to contact me. Um, I might take some time to answer you, but uh, anyway, uh, I'll try to answer my emails as soon as I can, um, probably within 24 hours. And uh, yeah, I wish you had a good lecture, and uh, if you have any questions, if we have time, I don't know. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your presentations, Dr. Asraf, uh, an associate professor on the Department of Botany of Plant Science, University of California, Riverside. Yeah. It's very interesting uh, slide. Yeah. We can learn from your slides. It provides uh, important knowledge for us, yeah. covering a lot of topics described in the slide related to climate change and its effect on growth productions, biological effects such as size, size and the color, change of the color, and also some biological uh, affected on fruits, yeah, such as on citrus, grape, and others. Yeah, and how we mitigate these situations, such as uh, you mentioned, by producing high temperature uh, fruit, uh, tolerant fruit culti cultivar, optimizations on irrigations, uh, management on abiotic stress, and also creating a microclimate yeah, using the ground mulching, the applications of the biostimulant like etephone and proton yeah, and improve the color of the fruits yeah, and also uh, applications of nutrients and antioxidants. So this is a very interesting uh, strategy. Yeah. Uh, I will open a questions for the students that uh, already joined with us. Yeah, they, I will this, this, the first round. I will open for the two questions. If any of the students online would like to ask a questions to Doctor Asraf, I will get you. So the purpose of the uh, this uh, visiting lecture is first is uh, I forgot to mention earlier sharing information and knowledge related to impact of the climate change on tropical and subtropical fruit production systems, mm -hmm. and also we are trying to initiate the collaborations between University uh, of Diponegoro and the Department of Botany and Plant Science in University of California. Uh, if possible, we can have a research collaborations or exchange of the students in the coming years. Uh, it is very interesting topics, and now this climate change is a uh, hot topics uh, that uh, all the people they are discussing uh, this this year. Now, because this year is the transition from the previous years, uh, we are now experience, experiencing the uh, high 
temperature anomaly and all and we discuss uh, today effect on the fruit production so yeah. if any of the students would like to propose a questions to dr asraf thank you there is a hand uh, fikri oh yeah Oh, yeah. Siapa? Siapa namanya? Oh, Diki. Oh, Dr. Asraf, we yeah. have a questions from the students named uh, Diki. And please, Mr. Diki, uh, propose a questions to Dr. Asraf. <laughs> uh, okay. So my question is, how to survive for a Maybe that's all. Thank you. Cam, I cannot hear. Can you? Uh, can you repeat the questions, please? Again, can you repeat it? Uh, please uh, speak uh, more slowly. Oke, okay. hello, hello. Ya, yeah. please repeat the questions. Oke, okay. how to surface or reduce the production of hormone ethylene in plants? Oke, okay. oke, okay. 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 thank how you. To, how to reduce the the ethylene in plants? Aku nggak dengar ya. Oke. Oh, thanks for the question. Ya, yeah. oh, oke, okay. that is a uh, It's another strategy we use it for some other crops. If you want to delay the ripening, you can reduce the ethylene or blocking the ethylene. There's two ways. If you look at the ethylene action inside the plants, there is first when the ethylene is produced inside the, the cell, they will have a receptor. It's like kind of protein that will take the ethylene and they exactly bind to the ethylene like this okay that is a protein and that is the ethylene to for the ethylene to make each reaction has to bind to this protein and this protein we call it receptor mm -hmm. so if that happened the protein the ethylene will make its own action but what happened if you put something here and this ethylene cannot go inside the protein so there is no action for ethylene so the first one is to block the receptors of ethylene and the blocking the receptors it can be uh, uh can be done by using what you call it uh, mcb mcb it's something similar to the ethylene but it's not active so it go here but it doesn't do anything so when it It goes to the receptor, bind with the receptor. The ethylene cannot find the receptor to bind. So that is one method, okay? It's just blocking or inhibit the receptor itself. The second thing, even if you have the ethylene that bind to the receptors and goes down to the signaling pathway, by the end of the signaling pathway, there is the ethylene action itself by the end of this pathway. You can stop this action and we can stop the action of ethylene by using any inhibitors there is inhibitor for ethylene biosynthesis that is the other thing so you inhibit the first one at the signal level which is the receptor you can block it also at the ethylene uh, biosynthesis level and that's also there's some chemicals like avg or um, sulfur nitrate You can spray it on the plants so you can stop or inhibit the ethylene action inside the, the, the fruits. We use those strategies to delay ripening. Sometimes, um, let's say, the most common one, like for example, um, banana, for example. Banana produces lots of ethylene. And a banana, if you cut it and leave it, without any treatment, they will produce a lot of ethylene and this will degrade the quality. 
that if you treat it with MCB or any other blocking agent for acetylene action, you can delay this senescence. And instead of having the banana for five days, you can have it for almost two weeks. That is very simple example of this. You got it? Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. It was a good question, yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Dickey, for the interesting questions. Any students would like to ask questions to Dr. Asraf? Please. So if there is no students, I would like to ask a question to Dr. Asraf. Yeah. On the amber fruit, uh, fruits with uh, losing uh, color, uh, do they also lose the sweetness? I mean, the, the sugar contents also reduce in the fruit. Yeah, that is a that's a, a very good question actually, and they it's supposed to have it here in this slide, but I didn't present all the the fruit quality when we compare um they like say for example San Joaquin Valley to Coachella Valley where uh, moderate to high temperature. When you grow grapes at high temperature, also you increase acidity and you reduce the sugar. That is definitely. Um, it, it it does happen, yeah. Uh, with uh, because it somehow is delaying the like um, you know it's, it's the the uh, the the double sigmoid curve is not uh, working as it's supposed to work. It's somehow um the degradation of acidity is low when you have high temperature. So you have high acidity and low sugar by the end when those fruits are harvested. Yeah. Thank you very much for the answer, Dr. Asraf. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay, please. There is a question from the students. Mr. Fauzan. Please. Okay. Uh, can you hear my voice? Yes. Sorry. Okay. Okay, Dr. Ashraf, I have a question about, uh, as we know, uh, supercar plants have a different temperature requirement on flowering. As we know, supercar plants have a different temperature requirement on flowering and vegetative growth. How to acclimatize supercar plants to tropical areas that tend to be warm without losing production? Yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much yeah, for the question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you want to grow subtropical in a tropical area, right? <laughs> okay, the you know we I mean with the climate change sometimes you know we'll be able to do that in some areas. It's just selection of the area that has less rain. Most of the subtropical they don't like too much rain during the ripening stage, and that is the issue when you grow them in a tropical area. Um, and also the winter is warmer in a tropical area. So is, I don't think it will be able to grow the subtropical in a tropical area unless it's very close to, you can manage it. The winter in the tropical area is 25 Celsius. 
With 25 Celsius, you cannot grow subtropical unless it is some kind like uh, maybe citrus will be okay, will be good. Um, evergreen trees like citrus, um, guava, mangoes. So you'll be very selective. You cannot put, say, for example, almond in a tropical area. Almond in a tropical area will not grow, will not do anything. So you need to be very selective. You select the crop that can be done. Mangoes can be done in a tropical, uh, citrus, uh, guava. It's so like a bunch of fruits really, that can be grown there. But the only issue will be the rain during the summer. If you have a rain in the summer, so you need to protect the trees. Maybe you can cover it. Okay. So you need to try. And that is, I like this question because it's, it's thinking about out of the box. You are thinking out of the box, which is, is good. That's where the innovation comes. Yeah, but you need to try, yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ashraf. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, yes, yes. Some more... Sorry? Please, uh, Please uh, ask a question for Mrs. Nadia. Oh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. From Mrs. Miss Sari. <laughs> okay, thank you. I have a question, sir. Mm -hmm. Can you describe the impact of climate change on the temperature requirement of subtropical fruit trees and how... Growers are adapting to these changes. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, as we mentioned, you know, and the warm winter is one factor. So you cannot, I mean, that would be a, uh, a determined factor for the deciduous fruits, like almond, pistachios, walnuts, those things. You need. Um, very, I mean, a cold winter, relatively cold winter. And if you don't have this, that will be translated on low bud break and erratic but uneven bud break. So you need to be ready for this. You can do some treatments to improve the shell unit, or you can do some some treatments to improve the bud break. Like we said here, the Dromex, for example, using Dromex to improve bud break. So you don't have any effect on the in the fruit uh, in the in the yield itself. That is one. The other thing, the high temperature during the the summer, and that is there is uh, so many research on this. And the uh, the most recent one is the netting, both the screen on the top of the trees, so you can reduce the temperature underneath of this screen and reduce the temperature. Um, uh, on the tree and make the trees grow better and have a good fruit quality. There's so many other um, treatments can be done, but you know every grower has its own condition in your market. Maybe grower in in Indonesia is not the grower in California. They have more different products than here, and grower in Europe maybe they have more material than here. And also will be restricted by the, the government. Sometimes you cannot spray everything here in California. There's there is laws, and you have to follow the laws of each country. So, like the Dormix, for example, Dormix for bud break, we use it here in California. But Dormix in some other countries, is, you cannot use it. So you have to shop around and see what is going on here, and use that the treatment which is available for you. Okay. Is it clear for Mrs. Sari? 
Enough. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, uh, uh, the students looks very interesting in your topics. There is one students as a question for Mr. Muhammad. Ada ya, kan? Oh. Ada nanya tadi. <laughs> Oke, okay. uh, one students, Mr. Randy Krishna, please uh, uh, ask a question. Oke, okay. uh, hello, Mr. Randy, and I want to ask about the material, some question regarding this topic. Uh, Oh, what is the question? Okay, uh, sorry, Mr. Afat. Uh, why profit site in the form of tree as it is done for coffee plants can improve the aroma and taste? Can grapes also improve the taste of grapes? Can you can you repeat it, please? Because the, the, the sound is not clean. Sorry, can you repeat sorry. the questions, Mister Andy? Please, uh, uh, as slowly. Uh, okay. Uh, why provide set in the form of three as is done for coffee? Plants can improve the aroma and taste. Can grape also improve the taste of grapes? Ah. So you're you're talking about the aroma in the coffee and the grapes? Yeah. yeah. Uh, can the grapefruit uh, improve the Uh, aroma maybe <laughs> yeah uh, i mean yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so let me tell you something I mean, yeah improving the aroma it is it is uh, like a hot topic right now in in some fruits like Coffee, as you said, and table grapes as well. Yes, and yeah. in, in California, I mean, especially in California, we are producing table grapes with different flavors. Actually, uh, some of them, the what do you call it, the cotton candy grapes. If you Google cotton candy grapes, it would be is a is a grapes. Uh, so. It has like test of the cotton candy. I think he put the the question in the chat. Why providing shade in the form of trees it is done for coffee plants can improve the aroma and taste. Can grapes also improve the taste of? Yeah, I mean, yeah, okay, yeah. You want to use the trees as a as a shade way. And it, that is okay. It has been done in some areas. Like I'm, as I mentioned in in the beginning, uh, I'm originally from Egypt, and in Egypt we grow mangoes and and citrus together. So the mangoes trees are larger, so they do some shading on the citrus, so they can protect them from the from the heat and from the sun. And actually, that is 
coming back as a new technology in some agriculture businesses is the seed using the trees. Yes, you can do that, but we're still in the beginning. We don't know. Again, I think it will be similar to the temperature. If it goes too much shade, you will have a, a negative effect. But if you have a moderate shade, that can help. So yeah, if you don't have anything, you can do that. You can uh, have a large tree, like several example, dead balms, for example. You do dead balms and some other crops. Uh, walnuts, walnuts is a big tree, and you can intercropping this with uh, another small tree. The mangoes and citrus, the same thing. You can do that. And in this case, yes, it will improve the aroma for sure. Because high temperature make like, you know, it's like what you when you boil water on the, you have a bottle with some water and you put it in, at high temperature, it will boil faster, right? But if you slow down the, the temperature or bring it down a little bit, it will take longer time to, to boil, right? The same thing, if you have a temperature, very high temperature in a short time, the fruits will not rise. It's just they will be cooked. Okay, but if you have a shade, that will give the fruits the time to go slowly into the physiological stage and produce the aroma. And that will help, yeah, for sure, yeah. Got it? Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay. Because of the time limitation, so <laughs> yeah. Doctor Asraf, uh, yeah, we know that uh, many students are interested with the topics and very yeah, interesting like topics. It. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like it. You know, I like how they are interacting and they are asking questions. That's really good. I like this. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. So. We would like to end this class, the, all the lecturers and the students for our from from our faculty would like to express our uh, profound gratitude. Many thanks for your valuable time. It's very nice to have you with us today, and if possible, we can have a research or student exchange collaboration between our faculty and the Department of Biology and Plant Science, University of California, Riverside, in the coming years. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. we're open for this and you're welcome to come and visit us at any time. <laughs> any, we'll be happy to collaborate with you on any project. Just let me know. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm sure. So once again, thank you for being a lecture for us. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Before you leave the class, uh, we would like to give a letter as uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Cert official certificate and oh, thank you. Of appreciation. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Again. Yeah. 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 You are welcome. Then, Dr. Yeah. Probably one day in the future, I will come and visit you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. We are Have looking for you. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> yeah. for all the students. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you bye very bye. much. Bye bye. So, okay. Uh, if you would would like to leave the class, I leave it to you, and we will see you on the other years. Yeah. Maybe we can take uh, some picture first. Oh. Okay. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, to celebrate this moment, please turn on your camera to join for the conversation. Yeah. Ready? Okay. We will take Masih. Masih. For the first time, on the count of three, one, two, three. Second one, one. Two, three.
Plus one. One, two, three. Alert. Thank you. Give a plus for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Once again, give a plus for the Dr. Ashraf. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ashraf. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the students who joining the lecture today with us. And thank you very much for the interesting questions. We will see you on the next year on the other visiting lecture program. Thank you. <laughs> nah. Thank you very much to our students. And wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.